Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, it's about 4.05, so I think we're going to get started, um, but people are free to walk in. Um, welcome to this Unlearn Week session. It's Monday. We're starting it off strong. Um, yeah, and so I'd like you guys to help me welcome Dr. Susan Berner, who recently graduated from a doctor's in ministry. <laughs> yes, um, and she'll be sharing a little bit about um, what she studied during that. So let's give her a round of applause and welcome her on. Thanks. It's good to be with you all today. Um, if we haven't gotten to meet before, I have been at Calvin for about two years now um, in the campus ministries office. But prior to that, um, I've always, my whole professional career has been in student college ministry. And um, so that really is the context for the project that I did and a passion of mine to work with college students. Um, and that's what led into my doctor of ministry project, which I'll share about with you today. Um, we'll get into the data and some of the nitty gritty of it. Um, but I'll also give you quite a bit of a foundation for um, what even led me to the project. And that will include part of my own journey um, in the midst of that as well. So um, I hope regardless of how we all racially identify today. Um, often I'll be talking about white people and to white people because that was what my project was. I am a white woman as well. Um, but regardless of how we racially identify, I hope we can all walk away with something today um, to help us think uh, what it might look like to love and live more like Jesus in a multicultural world. So a brief um, overview of where I'm going to take us today. We will start off ever so briefly um, introducing spiritual formation and spiritual disciplines, and then introducing cultural identity development and anti-racism. Those are really the two broad categories that undergirded my entire doctoral project. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about my doctoral study, the context and design, the project goals, the data, uh, conclusions from that study, and some thoughts about what could continue to be studied. And then I hope that we can walk, walk away today um, with just one idea of how to practice a spiritual discipline that might help you engage this better um, in your own faith journey. So before we dive in, I actually want us to begin today um, in a way that I began a lot of my doctoral sessions with my students, and that was by doing a litany for listeners. Um, it's a spiritual practice by Michael Hansen, and so I will read this aloud for us. It's a prayer, so I invite you to take whatever prayer posture you'd like um, as we pray this together. Dearest Lord, companion on the road, voice in the night, here we are gathered to listen. Open our ears, our whole being, that we may become a listening presence to each other, that we may enjoy the gift of our spiritual conversation. Give us the generosity to listen with openness. Give us the wisdom to understand what is heard, the strength to be changed by what is shared, the listening that never judges, the curiosity of a child. Increase in us the peace to forgive and to be forgiven, the reverence to honor both gift and loss, the acceptance that allows failure to be shared, the prudence to know when not to speak, the surrender that treasures silence after word. Enliven in us the freedom to let mystery be the joy to celebrate new discovery, the readiness for laughter when it rises, the grace to listen with humble love, the awe to hear you speaking in us. Thank you. Amen. All right, so we're going to jump right in to a brief introduction to what spiritual formation and spiritual disciplines are. Uh, formation plays a huge role in our lives, and I think we often don't recognize the power of formation. So I'll tell you a little story that I think illustrates this example. In the fall of 2019, I, after never having been a runner of any kind, decided I was going to run the Grand Rapids Half Marathon. Yeah, don't know where I got that idea, but um, I signed up and I committed to doing it. And so I pretty drastically had to start shifting habits in my life to prepare for this half marathon. So my already full schedule suddenly had to be adapted to uh, be able to accommodate running every day. <laughs> and I had to look the night before at the weather forecast and see when was it going to rain the next day because uh, I needed to plan my run around that. I started reading about running. I started buying shoes and socks and muscle cream and rollers and all these things that I did not have before to do this half marathon and to complete this. I was living towards something I wanted to complete a race and as a result my daily habits had to change. 
Dr. James K.A. Smith, a professor here in his very well-known book, You Are What You Love, says, you are what you love because you live towards what you want. What we desire or love shapes how we live. We all desire something or multiple things perhaps, and so we are constantly being formed by the way that we are living to desiring and loving those things. And as Christians, our desire and love for Jesus should shape how we live. David Swanson, in his book, Rediscipling the White Church, that I'll talk about a couple times today, um, says that discipleship is following Jesus to become like Jesus in order to do what Jesus does. So we follow to become in order to do. So you'll notice it's not merely to have relationship with Jesus and drown out everything else in the world and it's just me and God. It's relationship with Jesus that impacts how we live in God's world in the here and now. We want to become like Jesus so we can live in Jesus' world and advance Jesus' kingdom. And it's really important to know when we talk about spiritual disciplines that none of this is to earn God's favor or affection for us. We already have that. It's an invitation to live a flourishing life with God as those who are already loved by God. So then spiritual disciplines. How do we begin to do this thing called the faith journey? Becoming like Jesus isn't something that happens overnight or that we get to stop caring about and like eventually achieve. (laughs) Rather, it's something we're formed into over time for the length of our entire lives. Spiritual disciplines, or as we also refer to them in campus ministries often as faith formation practices, are key to this journey. I think there's two main ways that I see spiritual disciplines being essential in our formation. The first is their embodied practices. They are things that we actually do. It's not just acquiring knowledge and information. If I had merely read about running, I would not have crossed the finish line. I probably wouldn't have gotten past like mile two. That might be generous. (laughs) I had to embody running, right? In the same way, if we're cultivating a relationship with someone, we need to actually show them that we love them, not just say that we love them. There's things that we need to do. Smith goes on in his book to say, discipleship is a rehabilitation rehabituation of your loves. Therefore, discipleship is more of a matter of reformation than of acquiring information. Second, spiritual disciplines are practices that are habitual. They are repeated. Again, if I had gone on like two runs prior to doing this half marathon, I would not have made it. I had to repeatedly go on runs. Again, in a relationship where we're trying to show affection. If we do it once, that's not going to be enough to sustain a relationship over a period of time. In a similar way, we have to engage spiritual practices repeatedly that point us to Jesus and reorder our love to him to be formed to be more like him. Now, that doesn't mean that every single time we do them, we're going to feel the same way about it, right? Anyone who's done lots of workouts knows some are amazing and some are terrible. In the same way, when we practice spiritual disciplines, sometimes it might not feel like we're getting anything out of it. But that's not the point. It's to do it over time and to be shaped in a new way over a length of time. Um, Some examples of spiritual disciplines, if that's not something you thought about before, I think the ones we most commonly hear about are studying scripture or prayer or maybe fasting during the season of Lent. But there are so many other practices. Some might include hospitality, silence, solitude, Sabbath, worship, different kinds of prayer like prayer labyrinths, prayer walking, visio divina where we pray based on what we're seeing with our eyes, maybe artwork or creation. I highly recommend Adele Alberg Calhoun's book. My campus ministries people know I recommend this often. It's such a simple, practical handbook that lists so many spiritual disciplines that I didn't even know were considered spiritual disciplines. Um, It outlines the biblical foundation of each of them, but then also gives the fruit of those practices and then gives you ideas for them. So if you're curious, um, you can also just Google list of spiritual disciplines and you will come up with so many things more than you probably knew. So as we we repeatedly embody these practices, they not only can enhance, strengthen, and deepen our relationship with God, they can also form us to be new people who look more like Jesus and advance Jesus' kingdom in the world. And these have been an important part of my faith journey, especially in the last years, five years or so, as I've tried to intentionally engage ones that I maybe hadn't heard of before. So now, moving to a brief introduction to cultural identity, the other half of um, my project. 
Penelin, Dr. Penelin Dykstrom Prime, who's also here at Calvin, uh, wrote a book and defines cultural intelligence in this way. It's the capacity to engage in constructive ways with people who are different from us and with ideas that are different from our own, using an understanding of cultures and cultural identity. And she says there's three skill areas that we need to be able to do this. The first one is we need interpersonal cultural, sorry, we need to know the knowledge of cultural identities for ourselves. Second, we need to interpret various practices and perspectives. And third, we need interpersonal skills for connection. Now for most of my upbringing, I did not have these skills. Growing up, I primarily was in predominantly white spaces, often Christian spaces. I went to a Christian elementary, middle, and high school, and college. Uh, I can recall only ever having like a small handful of classmates who were people of color. I remember one high school teacher and one college professor who was a person of color. The churches I grew up in were predominantly white, and I remember like one or two guest preachers who were people of color. And my neighborhood was also predominantly white. After college, I began serving at a predominantly white Christian college, working in areas that pertained to residence life, chapel, and discipleship. And during this time, there were a few avenues, um, some with seminary classes. Um, one was a worship conference here, actually, at Calvin, the Worship Symposium, and some colleagues. And all of those things began to expose for me that I uh, didn't have a lot of understanding or awareness about my own cultural identity as a white woman or the impact of white culture. In other words, my cultural awareness and identity were severely underdeveloped. And that is actually quite common for white people. We are often unable to explain our own cultural distinctives or their impact. The first skill that Dr. Dykstra Prime mentioned and understanding of cultural identities is often lacking for white people, particularly in understanding their own. And there's a couple reasons why and a couple suggestions I'm gonna give us. Some are for white people and some are for all of us. So the first thing is resisting white normativity and colorblindness. One of the reasons that white people have a really hard time understanding what white culture is, is because of this idea of white normativity or white normalization. And to illustrate that, I'd like to share a story from Sandra Van Opstel in her book, The Next Worship, where she asks the question, is peanut butter and jelly ethnic food? So, <clears throat> excuse me. The story goes that there was a school district in the southern part of the United States that was doing testing on elementary school students. And it was to test if they could understand a process. Step one has to happen, step two, step three. And this school district was consistently scoring incredibly low. And a teacher finally sat in on the testing and was trying to understand why might the testing be scoring, why might this school district be scoring so low? And the teacher heard the question given to the students, and it was, describe the process of making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And the teacher immediately said, you need to switch the question to how to make a burrito. The students were primarily Latino and Latina, and the assumption had been made that a peanut butter and jelly sandwich was a normal food that any child in like first grade would know how to make. And as soon as the question was switched, the student scores went up. So this is an example, one example of many, of how things that are part of white culture are often seen as normal and everything else is seen as other. We can think of it in our own grocery stores here in Grand Rapids. There's the ethnic food aisle. And then there's all the other food aisles, right? Or when we talk about worship styles, maybe in our churches. There's so many examples of this. I'm sure you can think of some of your own. So when we're saying that something is normal, who is it normal for? Another thing, colorblindness. So, especially in Christian spaces, we often hear uh, white people say, I don't see color, everyone's equal to me, we're all the same. And the intention with that is, uh, they're trying to say, you know, they're trying to um, show that they understand that we have had a race problem in the U.S. and everyone is equal and we don't need to keep talking about that or see that. Everyone is just equal. Um, but Beverly Tatum in her book says that colorblind statements show white people assume they are completely free of prejudice, unaware of their own assumptions about other racial groups and keeps racism at a level of individual behavior while denying that there are systems that are advantageous to white people. 
So when we do this and, and claim colorblindness, not only are we dismissing the cultural distinctives and uniqueness and beauty of other cultures, white people are also dismissing that they themselves have a culture and that it too is distinct. Next, something we all can do, understanding cultural values and distinctives. For the sake of a good definition here, um, I'm going to use one from Aslam Sensoy and Robin D'Angelo, who say, culture is the norms, values, practices, patterns of communication, language, laws, customs, and meanings shared by a group of people located in a given time and place. So Calvin has a culture, right? The term loft, that means something here. If you went to another college in Grand Rapids and said loft, they would be like, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? So there's, there's distinct ways of living and doing things that are a part of a culture. Because of white normalization, white people are often described as fish in water and they struggle to define what is around them. We often miss what is around us as being culturally informed. We make assumptions of this is how I speak to authority figures, this is how I am a guest in someone's home and what I do with my shoes when I enter and how I greet them and how much food I should eat or leave, how to have all these interactions. There's beauty in our cultural distinctives. The problem is when we attach morality and superiority to one culture. You may have heard before, sometimes um, we say the white way of doing something is the right way of doing something. That's a problem. <laughs> As a call to white people especially, we need to begin to examine what are white cultural values and distinctives that we may be assuming are normal and not recognizing are actually culturally informed. But again, as Dr. Dykstra Prime, um, Prime says, uh, we can all be learning about cultural distinctives as part of our uh, cultural development journeys. Next, learning the history and the impact of race. Author Sarah Shin observes that there are beautiful and broken aspects to each culture and its history. And this is certainly true of white culture. There's lots of conversations going around in the US right now even about how we educate our children about the history of slavery and much more pertaining to race in the United States. Again, for the sake of a good definition, race is a socially constructed system of classifying humans based on particular phenotypical characteristics like skin color, hair texture, and bone structure. In other words, humans made up race based on how people look, and in its founding, it was to socially stratify people, often for economic and power gain. I was surprised as part of my learning to um, learn that Irish, Italian, and Polish immigrants initially were not classified as white in the United States. Um, and that was to keep a system of power and economic gain in place. So another question for us is what do I know about the history of race in the United States? What learning do I need to do? What are areas that I need to educate myself in? And maybe it gets even more specific to what about race in the institutions I'm a part of, the church I'm a part of, the neighborhood that I live in. And then last, cultivating anti-racism. So the term anti-racism um, is most associated with Ibram X. Kendi's book, and he says that an anti-racist is one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea, and that person will maintain the idea that racial groups are equals and none need developing their supporting policy that reduces racial inequality. So by doing some of the things that I've already mentioned, like resisting and recognizing white normativity and the temptation to be colorblind, understanding cultures and learning about the history of race and its impact, we can better start to understand where racist policy and action is taking place and we can actively participate in doing the opposite and advocating for the opposite. So that is some of the ideas that undergird um, the foundation of my project. And for myself, I began to see that I had a lot of intentional work to do in these areas. So reading, listening to podcasts, watching documentaries, um, conversing with others became a part of my journey. But as I did this and engaged in these more educational tools, I also found that my faith was being shaped. My view of God was being expanded through people who were different than me and through their culture and its values. I began to see the impact of my own biases, stereotypes, and racism within myself and the ways they inhibited my ability to be a kingdom citizen who advances God's love and justice in the world. I also became aware of how individualized I had been taught to view faith, where personal spiritual disciplines and practices 
were how my faith would grow and my relationship with the Lord was the most important. While attendance at public gatherings, aka church, was important, the value of community itself was underemphasized, as was communal issues. I also started to see how structural issues were impacting the ministry that I was doing. So as I read various authors on spiritual formation, cultural identity, race, anti-racism, two repeated themes started to arise. The first was this. Racism and the racial divide is inherently a discipleship issue. Again, from the book I mentioned before, white Christianity has been blind to the powerful racial discipleship that has formed the imagination of white Christians. Later, he proposes that uh, white Christians don't understand how they've been discipled and how their social imagination has been shaped. In a 2020 article by Diane J. Chandler, she talks about how because anything related to sin is a discipleship issue, racism and the racial divide should therefore be acknowledged and treated as a discipleship issue. It's not just something that's bad, it's <laughs> discipleship that needs addressed. And then a book from Scott Garber called White as Sin. He talks about um, the racial divide in the US and the racial dysfunction in the US and says that change is needed and then defines that change in this way. The change I'm talking about is fundamentally spiritual in nature. Now that may sound like good news for Christians since we specialize in spiritual solutions. But if we want to be part of that spiritual solution, we must first stop being part of the spiritual problem. And if we want to be part of that spiritual solution, we must stop thinking about spiritual change as a strictly private matter. Our response to social sin must affect both the world within us and the world around us. So these are just a few examples of how I began to see race, racism and the racial divide as a discipleship issue. The second thing that emerged was learning about our culture's history and racism is important, but it has to translate merely from knowledge to change behavior for the good of others. David Livermore's book says this, cultural intelligence is a pathway to help us along the journey from desire to action. It's the bridge that helps us more effectively express and embody Christ's unconditional love across the chasm of cultural differences. Later, he says, this isn't to simply keep up appearances. <laughs> it's for genuine kingdom work. Another book um, that is more about Christian, or not Christian, um, that's more about higher education and race um, says this, transformation as a form of practical labor leads to knowledge instead of knowledge leading to transformation. So she says it even a little more strongly. And then another book about anti-racism and spirituality says, when anti-racism is an intentional practice for Christians, there's opportunity to be formed into the beloved community as God intended. A couple cautions come with this um, from some authors. Leila Saad says, such work is never merely an intellectual exercise but concerns real people. Um, that is very important to be mindful of. This is real people, real stories, real pain, real history. Um, it's not just something that we're feeding our minds with and being entertained by maybe even. And then there's often a false piety that arises when white Christians connect anti-racism with spirituality. That is also something to recognize as we engage this work. Um, white Christians especially, and I speak for myself in this as well, um, we can often want to be seen as an ally, as someone who is trusted by people of color, and so this personal piety and gain starts to become the desire of which we do this, um, and that is not helpful or um, good motives. In reflecting on Christian faith, when I think about this, these ideas of um, of racism and the and the racial divide being a discipleship issue, and then learning about these things, um, translating to change behavior and not just knowledge, I automatically notice a pattern with our faith stories, like I've already, or with our faith journeys, like I've already mentioned, where we're not just acquiring this information; it's leading to change behavior. And again, thinking back to the impact and purpose of spiritual disciplines, it's essential that belief and knowledge is supplemented with spiritual disciplines and practices through repetition that shape and transform us out of our old habits and our old instincts and into new Christ-like ways. 
So my curiosity increased for myself initially, but as I was supervising and mentoring mostly white students um, responsible for worship and discipleship ministries, I started to see that my journey and initial unawareness and ignorance about white culture and its impact was resonating with those same students I was leading. And as we sought to more inclusively minister to our campus, it was imperative to learn about white culture, recognize white normativity, and understand racism. And this was not in isolation of the practice of our faith, but rather in conjunction with living our faith. So I was curious about it would look like not to just talk about and have training sessions around these things, but to actually practice our faith together with these things in mind through spiritual disciplines. And though I previously had conversations with students in interracial groups, contemporary literature also makes an interesting case for there being benefit at times to have in-group conversations, meaning with similar people. And so, as a white woman working with mostly white students, I started to wonder for the sake of my doctor project what it would look like to have an in-group conversation with just white students. In some of the benefits of this um, would be that students of color wouldn't be put on the spot and asked to share their story and their experience and speak for all people of color. Nonetheless, I intentionally sought to center people of color in their stories through books and articles and videos, things that they had already put out there in content to be the center of our gatherings. So all of that is foundational both in my story and into the content that led to my doctoral project, which we will now dive into. So the purpose of my project was to impact the participant's spiritual formation with an emphasis on cultural identity with a select group of white Christian college students at Calvin University. The research question is, a slight rewording of that, how can spiritual formation with an emphasis on cultural identity impact a select group of white Christian college students at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, for this project, I led three sessions that were three hours long each with a group of eight white students at Calvin who selected themselves to be a part of this process. The sessions covered various topics relating to spiritual formation and cultural identity development. More specifically, this was done through practicing spiritual dis disciplines together while learning about and engaging various issues related to culture and race in the United States and in the white evangelical church. As part of my doctoral defense, I was asked, um, what, what problem were you seeking to address in this project? And I think the main problem I sought was to engage this in engaging this project was to help white Christian college students better engage in the contemporary racial issues and recognize that it is connected to their Christian faith and intentionally seek to form themselves to respond to those issues in Christ-like ways. There have been many racial injustices throughout history and many of it in the past few years has come to the surface of our dialogue. However, despite these realities, a Barna study from 2019 to 2020 noted a significant decrease in motivation promoting racial justice among white Christians. This was opposed to every other racial category where the number was either similar or significantly increased. And though some might think that younger generations are more motivated, research also shows that largely younger generations have many similar beliefs and responses to racial issues as those in older generations do. College students are at a uniquely formative time in their lives. They're asking lots of questions. They're forming personal faith for many of them apart from their parents for the first time. Meeting them at this intersection of exploring their Christian faith and what it might have to say about current issues and how their faith informs their responses to those issues is important and something I'm passionate about. Underlying my work in this project is my belief that if Christians are to recognize and live into the reality of interconnectedness between relationship with God and with each other, it's imperative for white Christians in the U.S. to explore cultural and racial dynamics. So the context of my project, this is the first time I'm presenting it to Calvin people, so I don't have to tell you a ton about the context because you are here and you know, um, but this is some of the data and facts about how Calvin and the CRC has engaged anti-racism and diversity and equ equity and inclusion. And then I know those um, stats from the student body are old. That was um, at the time when I did my project proposal, what I had to submit as part of that. So that's why they're there. Um, just some maybe interesting things to know. I invited over 219, uh, 219 students um, from eight different student groups, 
via email to be a part of the project. I don't know how many of those were, would identify as white, um, but again, it was made clear that you had to be white to be a part of my project, and eight committed to coming to all three sessions, which if you're a college student, you know it's a big deal to commit to nine hours of required uh, sessions with no incentive or requirement attached at all. <laughs> Um, so I was very grateful for them. One participant was a sophomore, five were juniors, and two were seniors. All eight reported to being Christian for seven years or more. Um, and they said that family and church were their two most spiritually formative contexts growing up. The majority of the group also reported that they largely were in racially homogeneous um, experiences growing up in high school and in churches. Uh, I think it's important to note the fact that this group of students self-selected shows that there was some level of interest and openness. Um, it wasn't a requirement. They weren't forced into it. And so I think that's just important to note as we get into some of the data. The design of this project, it was an impact study, meaning that I was measuring the impact of the experience um, in our sessions together. So they did a pre-assessment and a post-assessment. There were 15 questions, um, three questions per goal, which will be on the next slide, so you'll know the goals. Um, but 15 questions, and they uh, responded to each of those. They were statements, um, responded to each of those somewhere along that seven-point Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And in the post-assessment only, there was a short answer for every project goal that they responded to. And it tended to be worded like, what, um, what stood out to you the most about confession or something like that. Um, so I'll get into what came from that. The small group sessions were designed around each of the project goals. So these were the project goals. Um, the first was to impact the participants' understanding of spiritual formation with an emphasis on white cultural identity. So it was important to me that they understood about spiritual formation, like I briefly went through with you at the beginning, um, but also that they learned about what white, white cultural identity was. The second goal was to impact the participants' spiritual formation through the process of lamenting the complicity of the white evangelical church regarding racism in the United States. That gets at some of the history. And then impacting their spiritual formation through confession of systemic racism, through practicing compassion, number four, by being merciful towards those who culturally differ from themselves, and then five, to impact them through practicing humility by learning about different cultures. So the first session that we did, um, the first three hours broadly covered that first goal. Um, we did the Intercultural Development Inventory, or the IDI. Um, if you've never heard of that, it's an assessment that measures your monocultural or intercultural mindset. There's a continuum, and it measures where you think you operate and then where you actually operate most of the time. So we debriefed those results together as well as part of session one. And then the third, second session focused on goals two and three, and the third session focused on goals four and five. Um, at both of those sessions, we engaged a variety of readings, videos, group discussions, journal prompts, written litanies and prayers like I did at the beginning with you, um, all parts of uh, doing this together, of learning and practicing spiritual disciplines at the same time. So what were the findings, right? That's the whole outcome of this. Here's my dissertation in one slide. <laughs> um, so as you can see, uh, each goal is listed there. And then the blue represents where the students average scored on the first pre-assessment. And the gold measures where they were during the second assessment. And then I put a little reminder word there for you for what each goal was. And then in the left, under each goal, it says the measure of impact. So you can see goal three that related to confession was most impacted, followed by lament. Those were very close, very, very close. Um, and then that was followed by humility, and then spiritual formation and culture, and then compassion. These were the three statements that were on the assessment that related to confessing systemic racism. And so here too, you can see the breakdown of scores. They're also ordered in most impact to least impacted down or from the top to the bottom. I won't linger long on these, but I know some of you might be curious. So this is lament.
humility. spiritual formation and cultural identity. And then lastly, compassion towards different cultures. This is another way of viewing the data. So now it's, um, again, from greatest impacted to least impacted, but in gold this time, that's the newest information, um, that was the most commonly cited theme in the participant short answers at the end of the study. Um, so related to confession, um, the most common response that I got was students recognize personal responsibility regarding racial issues. For lament, uh, multiple people, the most common cited one, was a corporate and communal necessity of lament. The need of doing that together, not just behind closed doors in your bedroom, um, but doing that together in community and how that's historically lacked. And then with humility, the most cited thing was the importance of learning about and experiencing other cultures. For spiritual formation and white cultural identity, the students most commonly talked about recognizing that whiteness has been centered in Western Christianity. Um, so that um, within that, students talked about um, theology and who we look to as having sound doctrine, being largely from uh, white theologians. Uh, we talked about worship music, all kinds of things within church gatherings, church doctrine, church history um, came up in those responses. And then last in compassion, the thing that they mentioned the most was how central of a discipline that is to Christianity and into in becoming Christ-like. So some general broad conclusions um, from my study for some interpretations. Um, first of all, confession and lament were the two spiritual disciplines that came up the most, I would say, in the reading that I did related to spirituality and race and faith. Um, and I think this shows there's good reason for that. It's what is really impactful for us to engage with. Second, um, the initial rankings could speak to familiarity and our comfortability with the topic and discipline. So going back, um, you'll notice lament and confession scored the lowest initially. So of course, it had the most room to grow and be most impacted. Um, so I think that can speak to both um, yeah, both the fact that students maybe were least familiar with lament and confession, but also um, that complicity of the white evangelical church regarding racism and the idea of systemic racism might have been most unfamiliar out of all of them, least approachable, maybe is how you could see that too. And then um, I think this study just shows that in general, a group experience practicing spiritual disciplines can be an effective means of impacting spiritual formation as it relates to cultural identity. Given this was a very limited group, <laughs> a very limited sample size, I recognize that as if you've ever heard people say the more school they, they do, the more they feel like they don't know. I feel that way. Um, <laughs> so this group experience, I think, does show there was impact. Every single one of the goals was positively impacted, which is a good thing. Um, so I think there's more to be explored here, which, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but some application, what can we do with this? I think this shows um, that we need to continue to disciple people in Christian higher education and in our churches more broadly to engage issues of race and faith through a lens of spiritual formation by practicing spiritual disciplines. Um, I think this is a way that we can get it practical on the ground um, and engage it in that way. And then continuing to teach about and practice confession and lament as it relates to current issues in our churches and gatherings. Again, it was um, 
least known about and talked about, it seemed like, in students' experiences. And I think I hear that outside of the study. I hear that from students. Um, and so I think it's important for us to be thinking about confession and lament outside of personal confession and lament, too, right? I think we um, can be good about bringing a prayer request of, oh, my mom's in the hospital, my dad's sick or lost a job or whatever. We can bring our personal um, laments. But what does it look like to bring corporate laments of entire people groups to our gatherings? Um, so some further study that could come from this study, um, obviously a larger sample size and more sessions, I think could be really helpful in getting us some better data on this. Um, again, I had to have everyone at every session, so it was very limited in being able to do three sessions. Um, but doing more, I think, could achieve a lot and having more people involved. And then one thing I would be really interested is in, in is measuring the impact um, further in life. So this was one experience, but what would it look like if someone's practicing these disciplines for five or ten years? How does that um, impact their life, how they live, and what their faith looks like? Um, I think certainly other spiritual disciplines, if we, if we view all of them as being uh, able to help us love God better and love each other better, any spiritual discipline um, could potentially be impactful in this journey. And then outside of issues of race, I think we could look at spiritual disciplines impacting how we relate to people in all kinds of um, issues and injustices that happen in our world. And then obviously this one was grounded in Christian higher education. A lot of my dissertation research was specific to Christian higher education and some of the uniqueness about race within predominantly white Christian institutions, um, but certainly this should uh, spread out from outside of that, I would say. Um, so of course, I think we get to the end of all of this and the question we ask is now what? And if you're going to a bunch of unlearned sessions this week, you're getting a lot of content. Um, and so I wanna keep it really simple and practical and I would just encourage you um, to choose maybe one area of focus that I covered in the beginning relating to culture and race that you maybe feel like you have some learning or unlearning to do in and then choosing one spiritual discipline. Um, I listed the ones that I did there, but again, you could find so many more um, whatever fits the season of life that you're in and something that you want to explore and think through how you can practice that in light of considering, um, yeah, what it, what it might mean to do that, um, not only for your own faith life and relationship with God, but for the love of all the people around you. Um, really briefly, since we have a couple minutes, um, this is from Adele Albert Calhoun, and I just want to give you an example of um, lament, since that was one of the ones that was most impacted. So on the left column there, those are some of the desires, definitions, and scriptures that she attaches to lament, ways that we can approach God with the realities of sorrow, frustration, and angst that consume and distract us. And then when we actually practice lament, some of the things that we can do are putting words to the contents of our hearts, trusting God to hold the pain while we cry and rail, praying psalms of lament, or entering the wilderness with Jesus when we are tempted by the evil one. And then she talks about some of the fruit of practicing lament. That could be honesty, awareness of your internal weather, trust in God's ability to hold all of you, going to the depths with God rather than catastrophic thinking, casting your burdens on God rather than shouldering them alone. Sung Chan Ra says that lament challenges us to say, maybe I don't know everything, and it opens us to listening to others who have a different set of stories and history than us to learn more about God. Lament reminds us God is present in all situations and circumstances. So when we practiced lament together in one of my sessions, we then watched a couple videos about race and faith in the United States and the history of race um, within the church. And then we responded um, with this practice of um, liturgy of lament where we read Psalm 79 and then responded in these ways. Um, another thing that we, um, that I encouraged them to do was to write out their own lament. Um, and so there's a five step process there at the bottom of what laments typically look out, look like. And then they were able to write their own lament to God um, based on the video that they had watched um, about racial injustice and were able to bring that lament to God. Um, and then I'll just invite us into this one. So Latasha Morrison in Be the Bridge has um, a much longer liturgy of lament, and this is only part of it. Um, but this is another thing that we did as part of our process. So I'll invite you where it's italicized um, to read aloud with me. We cry out to you, our God and Redeemer, as the only one who can save us from ourselves. 
Show us our blind spots. Don't let us hide from you in our shame and guilt. Restore us to your perfect union that can be found in Jesus Christ. Lord, show us how to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Lord, with deep sorrow, we lament. So that's just one example of how you could practice this spiritual discipline. Um, again, we didn't receive <laughs> the content of learning all about the history of race in the church in the U.S., but um, you could do that in response to a news article, a headline, um, whatever whatever comes your way. Um, to end, I just have two final slides. Um, if you're curious, I'm a big book person, and I'm constantly giving book recommendations, so you can snap a photo if you want um, to pick up a, a book for later. White Awake and Rediscipling the White Church, which are in about the middle of the screen. Those um, I highly recommend to white people who are wanting to learn more about this and are kind of like in the initial stages of I haven't done a ton of thinking around this. Um, but all of those on there are fantastic. <laughs> And then, um, again, I did a lot of reading about race and Christian higher education, and given that we're in a Christian higher education context, if that's something you're interested in, um, these would be some good books to check out as well. That is all I have prepared. I have time for a question or two if anyone has one. It's okay if you don't and you just want to head to dinner too. <laughs> Yes. Was it challenging for you when you were going through this journey? I'm still on it, I would say. And yes, yeah, for a variety of reasons. Um, sorry, for the sake of the recording, it was asked um, if it was challenging for me to go on this journey. So yes. Um, yeah. No. No, it's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, Yes, there were certainly challenging aspects, probably many. I don't know that I could name all of them in the moment. Um, yeah, I had a lot of my own learning and processing to do first um, before I engaged this with students, and that was a really important part of my journey. But also, um, Daniel Hill talks about um, shame and guilt that can come up as part of that and the processing that people white people need to do with that and so i think that was part of my journey and story um yeah when you start to see things you you really start to see them and and start to identify ways that you've contributed i speaking for myself i started to realize ways that i had harmfully contributed to things and so there was a lot to unpack there um yeah Really yeah. Like, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Robin D'Angelo has a book called White Fragility that goes into it much better than I could. Um, but to summarize a little bit of her work and a little bit of Daniel Hill's work again, um, something that I can relate to and have seen also um, is a lot of white people want to be seen as good and as morally safe and okay. Um, and so when we are confronted with this idea that something we've done or um, something that we're a part of has contributed to racism, it is very shocking and jaunting and makes us think, oh, I'm a horrible person. <laughs> and then defenses go up often um, to protect from that. So that's a really good question. Yes, Pastor Terrence. Thank you for sharing yeah. this. Uh, Mm -hmm. being willing to share this. Mm -hmm. The question that I have specifically is that is there some thought taking this to faculty, staff, and otherwise? Because the students are very open at some point to learn yeah. and grow. For those of us who are you know, beyond the 50 mark, we tend to seem to be stuck in sure. our thinking or stuck in our perceptions of things. Because this is definitely a deep um, topic yeah. that requires Yes. Yes. So have you about Maybe. Are you Are you giving me an assignment? <laughs> Sounds good. We'll chat. I know where your office is. Um, <laughs> yeah. I I think it's for all of us, right? So my passion has been students, and that's very very much been my focus and my heart. But I I hear you and agree that it's for everyone. And so yeah, I'd be interested in exploring that. But thank you. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much, everyone. I'm so grateful that you gave up an hour of your time to come listen. Um, I think there's a QR code that you can scan to get credit so that you can earn another credit towards a free t-shirt. Um, yeah, and be sure to check out the other events happening. Tonight, what time is the documentary? Seven in CFAC Auditorium. So don't miss that. Thanks so much. Thank <laughs> you.